Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of In the Barn. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we're going to dive into the science of safety. We're going to look at the current research and safety standards for some of the most used equestrian safety products, helmets and jump vests. Are these products really helping us to be safer when we ride, or do they contribute to a false sense of security? Newsflash for all you fools out there, it's going to be a horrifying episode. Oh my gosh. Buckle up and get ready. Grab your butts and buckle up. Don't forget to check out last week's episode where we discuss part three of the bit for spitless debate. We try to get a better understanding of what factors lead to a horse's discomfort or pain when being directed by either a hackmore or a bit. And of course, don't forget to leave a review on the Apple Podcast app as this helps others to find us and helps our podcast to appear in related searches on the app. Thanks for listening and enjoy the episode. Okay, so I just want to start the episode out with a quick disclaimer. We are talking about safety products, helmets and jump vests, but this is not us trying to encourage anyone to either wear a helmet, not wear a helmet. We just want to talk about the products themselves, what the standards are, what the research is around them. I think we all understand at this point that there is an inherent risk to riding horses. So we're not going to try to convince you that you need a helmet or you need a jump vest. We just want to talk about the products themselves and you do you. All right. And this week, you were the one that looked at helmets and I specifically looked at air vests. No, so not like traditional jump. Well, no. Not necessarily traditional jump vest, but I was looking at the explosive air vest. The explosive? Did you say explosive or exclusive? They explode. I didn't I didn't know if you said explosive. You said it weirdly that I wasn't sure what the word you were trying to say. It sounded like you combined exclusive and explosive and you were like They're exclusively explosive. That's true, they are. Actually I hear the bangs not that loud. Right? It's just like a bang. You know what actually? Um the CO2 cartridges in air vest is very similar to that of the flotation devices beneath your seat on an airplane. So your life vest on an airplane, very much so the same style where you pull a little cartridge canister and it inflates, very similar to a jump vest. That actually makes total sense. That that checks out. I feel like that checks out. Are the CO2 cans, like, are they the same ones you would put in a gun as well? Like a CO, like a, a airplane. <laughs> a gun gun. <laughs> I'm not like that weird. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> oh, sorry, my only like my only shooting experience, really. Actually, that's not true at all. I do have real gun experience, but my own main shooting experience is with CO two guns. Same, like it's a BB gun, right? Like a BB. Yeah, gun. Well, that's what we have. We have those at home. Yeah, but I don't think it's the same CO two cartridge. I think they use different ones. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so helmets first. Yeah, lead us off. I feel it. Like, I don't know. I don't really have a great segue into this. So um, I wanted to look at helmets and jump vests after I had seen in a couple groups on Facebook and on the horsey pages, people talking about this idea that like wearing these products gives you a false sense of security and that you're like better off without them. And I was just like, I thought that was a really interesting concept. Like, are these products really not that safe and that using them is, is it like a false sense of security? So I was curious to kind of like start researching helmets. So when do you think helmets defined as a safety bucket for your head, not just like a hard hat for your head, but a safety bucket with harness? I'm trying to think back to like watching, growing up watching, you know, eventing DVDs and all those old Pony Club DVDs mom used to make us watch. And I swear they were wearing helmets all the way back then and like, 60s and 70s i mean that's a fair guess those just are not helmets <laughs> those are hunt caps with straps so helmets really didn't become popular until in the u.s in the early 90s and england a few years before that and this was really prompted by pony club pony club wanted to ha- require helmets for their members and they wanted some safety standards around those helmets so in 1983 pony the british pony club asked for whatever the British version of safety standards is to create helmet standards. And then the United States Pony Club asked in 1986 to get standards in the United States. So that is when we saw a big push of helmets was the early 90s and into today. Those are actual helmets that are designed with the intent of protecting someone's head if they fell off. Those other things that you saw prior to that are mostly hunt caps or riding hats. And they're just like hardened plastic shells with some velvet on the outside. They're not, they weren't actually designed to protect your head. They were designed to look cool. So the helmet progression and headgear progression really started back in 1793. Fox hunters were using top hats 
this is actually, we'll get to it in a second, but top hats are still being used till very, very recently in the dressage arena at the FEI level um, at international competitions. You could still use top hats until very, very recently. Uh, but these top hats are mostly used by fox hunters. And the taller the top hat, the richer you were. That was how you showed your uh, wealth and influence. You had a nice horse and a fancy top hat. So A. Blinken was doing really well then, right? He always had a crazy tall top hat. He was. Except for, unfortunately, not very aerodynamic. So <laughs> very easy to lose while out hunting. So in 1849, the bowler was invented, which was a little bit smaller and a little bit more aerodynamic. And those are still being used and very popular in the saddle seat show ring. I did not know this, but you could wear top hats until January 2021. Top hats just got outlawed by the FEI. All riders so now need to wear a helmet in FEI competition. So in June 2020, uh, this was an opinion piece on Euro Dressage their webpage by Daniel Pinto called Top Hat or Helmet? Shouldn't it be each rider's choice? And he discusses FEI's new helmet rule. And for whatever reason, this new helmet rule was specifically targeted at dressage riders, but applies to everybody. So even vaulters and rainers now have to wear helmets and drivers. And for whatever reason, he was surprised. Vaulters? Yeah, he was surprised in his opinion piece that the only org like group that was fighting this new helmet rule was dressage riders. That the vaulters didn't seem to pay attention. And rainers are really interesting. Rainers actually are co-governed by the FEI and the National Raining Horse Association. And so they have a very interesting relationship where they basically hate each other, but rainers want to be FEI so they can go to the Olympics and go to like these big world competitions. But like they don't get along with the two governing organizations don't get along at all. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and like... I don't know. The future of reigning is a big question mark. <laughs> but basically, the new revised rule strips individual disciplines from their current governing power to choose their own head protection rules for competition. It makes it mandatory for all riders to wear approved protective gear on their heads anytime they are mounted on FEI showgrounds, including in the dressage arena. Yet the new rule still allows individual disciplines to decide whether riders may remove their headgear during awards ceremonies and playing of the national anthem. That's really kind that we can decide <laughs> to remove it during the national anthem. I think the only one that I really have a question about there is I'm concerned that they're making the vaulters wear hem helmets and headgear. I, yeah, I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens, but this rule went into effect this year. So it's a brand new rule, and I don't know if what the plan is, Weird. if vaulters have some loophole built in, if like while they're performing they don't have to wear it, but they have to wear it if they're like warming up the horse or lunging the horse. I, I don't know. But this is really going to upset William Fox Pitt because he is a huge top hat lover. And there's like a quote from an article quite a few years ago where he was like, I'm not wearing a helmet unless they force me to. And he didn't call it a helmet. He called it a crash cap or something. And he was like very, very very not into it. Well, buddy, now they're forcing you. <laughs> yeah. So up until recently, as of this year, right, dressage riders could choose between a hat and a top hat if they were on, if they were not competing at a national level, but were competing at FEI level exclusively, were over 18 and weren't uh, competing in any para-Olympics or paraplegic sports. So if you're a paraplegic, regardless of the level or your age, you had to wear a helmet. And there's like concern that this now makes dressage look dangerous. I don't think wearing a helmet makes dressage look dangerous. Yeah, don't, I don't think so either. I think the horse. I think I think it's just the horse in general, like <laughs> in all sports. I don't know. Um, and then the other org big organization is AQHA. Obviously, they don't require helmets unless you're riding English. So anyone under 18 has to wear a helmet if they're riding English and then anyone jumping. And this made me think of random barn rules. Is it just me or does your barn also have a weird rule about like, only English riders have being required to wear helmets because I think the barn I'm at now, it's all English riders have to wear a helmet regardless of age, where like Western riders don't have to wear a helmet regardless of age. And I just like, what is the what is the difference? <laughs> like, why are English riders targeted for helmets and Western riders aren't? This is like something that I've run into in a lot of barns where like if everyone under 18 has to wear a helmet or all English riders under 18 have to wear a helmet or all English riders have to wear a helmet. And I just want to point out that the last three times I've fallen off my horse, 
not writing English. I was writing Western. <laughs> and like very, very much so writing Western, not arguably writing Western. Um, like it wasn't up for debate. I was definitely writing Western. But then again, like what do you define as Western? That's the other thing that always trips me up. Like do I have to have a curb bit and then I don't have to have a helmet? Or do I have to have like if I have a snaffle, then I have to have a helmet? Like where's your defining line? Are they defining it by Western pleasure only? And not like if you're gaming, you have to wear a helmet. But even then they don't require it. I don't know. I just think it's a weird role, and I've run into this at, like, multiple barns. And so I just – I think it's a weird – it's a weird, like, stigma. Or I don't know, is that stigma? It's a weird little right? twilight like, zone, I think, when it comes to the rules of helmet. Yeah. Okay. So for most of us at this point, we are pretty familiar with the phrase ASTM SCI approve. And do we know what that means? I have a quick anecdote real quick with that one. Growing up in like pony club and stuff, we would go to quiz rallies and this was always one of the questions where they ask you like, what does your helmet have to be uh, certified under? What is the little safety sticker has to have in it? And for the life of me, I could never get those letters in the correct order. So they'd ask me and I'd be like, A-T-M-S-S-I-E. And never once, like I had all the right letters, never once did I have them in the correct order. That's pathetic. So it's ASTM approved and SCI tested is what it means, essentially. So I found an article from Equus that is from, was published in 98, 2003, and 2017, which means our standards really haven't changed much since 1998, which is interesting as 1998 was really around the time standards were being developed. I mean, they were developed a little bit earlier in the early 90s, but helmets were coming onto the market rapidly in the late 90s to be certified. And I just think it's an interesting thing I'm gonna throw out there that we've had two code changes or two standard changes. So we're on our second set of standards where other countries have gone through a lot of standards in the same amount of time. This study is titled Riding Helmet Safety Standards. And so it looks at and kind of breaks down how the safety standards work. So the American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM, is a century-old organization that writes safety standards for everything from artificial playground surfaces to firefighter suits. The ASTM draws up testing procedures and safety requirements for each item, standards that can be adopted by individual organizations such as USA Equestrian. So ASTM is recognized this is as an international, ASTM International is their full name. They added international because they want their standards to be worldwide, is classified by the United States uh, IRS as a nonprofit organization, which I think is interesting because to get their standards, you have to purchase them. And I like, is that normal? Like you volunteer to adopt their standards, but then you also have to buy their standards. And that doesn't seem like a nonprofit to me, but I, I'm on the NASA tax, man. I'm not gonna, I don't know. I just want to point out that these are not government mandated. Like the government is not involved in any of these standards whatsoever, at least for, for our country, for ASTM standards. This is a totally separate nonprofit that makes up, writes these lists, and then different organizations can choose to adopt them. It was started by a group of scientists and engineers um, led by Charles Dudley in 1898, and they formed ASTM to address frequent rail breaks and railroad accidents. So they wanted to like get standardized steel um, in the railroad industry so that the railroad cars would stop like running off the tracks and like killing people. And so they (laughs) invented this uh, organization to create rules for people. And I just love the thought that there was like somebody out there is like, I want to make rules for you. Like, I just love that. Like this idea of like, I'm not part of your group, but I'm going to make a rule and you have to follow it. Like just randomly wants to to make a rule for them. (laughs) Okay, so at this point, ASTM has 30,000 members, including our 1,100 organizational members, which is like US Equestrian, FEI, those sort of, those are organizational members, and 140 countries that use their standards for like different things. Once standards are in place, the Safety Equipment Institute, SEI, ensures that they are followed by manufacturers who do their own in-house testing or contract the testing out to other laboratories. To earn certification, all protective helmets, including bike, hockey, equestrian, etc., are dropped onto a flat anvil from a height of about six feet and from several angles and directions. A second anvil test is designed um, with the particular risks of the sport in mind, which basically they just crush the head with the other anvil. Computer sensors will then 
determine the amount of G's that that helmet was able to sustain before it like broke or separated or whatever. And then another test looks at the harness. Did the harness break? Does the harness stay on the head when it goes through these tests? And then these helmets are also treated to heat. So they go to minus 20 degrees and then they're heated up to 120 degrees uh, in water and then they're like submerged in water. So they're heated and cooled and left in water and then all these tests are done again and they have to still make it to the same standards. So the other standard standard that we use in the United States, which is not super common, there is a competing company for ASTM. It is Snell. This is a company out of California, and this was started after William Pete Snell, racer of the year, died needlessly in 1956 Sports Cl Car Club of America racing event. So he died racing his car. His then state-of-the-art helmet made of leather and pressed cardboard paper didn't protect him. Go figure. So that's what I'm saying, Robin, in the, like, that was 1956. His helmet it was made out of cardboard. <laughs> what you're watching riders in is probably not super like those weren't helmets. Not saying horse riders were using cardboard. We probably knew a little bit better than that. So the following year, in memory of Pete, a number of his friends and colleagues and fellow racers, including Dr. George Snively, formed the Snell Memorial Foundation, now known as the Snell Foundation. Its purpose was to set helmet performance standards to encourage the development and use of truly protective helmets. So Snell standards are much more comprehensive than ASTM standards. But Snell standards also, they have a bunch of regulations that are standards that you can use for motorcycles, for uh, like BMX racing, for car racing. And so their standards have been adopted by cars and I think like motocross mostly. They are not adopted in motorcycle standards because the motorcycles still use ASTM, SCI, and um, we still, uh, as horse people, whatever our organization is, still uses STM. So their tests are a lot more comprehensive. They include... Um, they gr drop a greater crush rate. They have uh, not only, so the different anvil tests that exist. So it, ASTM SEI standards, you have a sharp anvil that mimics a horse head. So it's like you got stepped on by a horse and then a flat ground that you get, the helmet gets dropped on. For British and European standards, the British standards are 800 newtons of pressure, a puncture test. So they have one at an anvil that mimics a stud going through your helmet, a hoof going through your helmet, and then a flat drop. Europe has a lighter crush test, the stud test, and a flat drop. And then Snell has a pretty, like, the heaviest crush test, stud drop, the hoof drop, the flat drop, and a round drop, maybe, which is like a log. I don't know what the round anvil is supposed to represent, but those are the most comprehensive testing. A Snell and ASTM SEI is the least comprehensive testing. Every country has like a little bit of a little tweak on their standards, but a lot of helmet companies, not all of them, create helmets that can be sold internationally. So like Charles Owen, for example, makes helmets that can be sold in England, Europe, and the United States. And then some of their helmets meet snail standards, but I don't know if all of them do. So one of the things I was trying to do with my research was just to determine if any of these helmet companies were making unrealistic claims or if they like any bad advertising or just like, I feel like helmets would be one place where you'd want to brag a little bit, but I was actually disappointed. Most companies were pretty, like didn't make any bold claims. Most companies obviously don't have research on their web pages. So while this is probably one of the most regulated and most researched aspects of the horsey world and horse tack, obviously companies don't want to share their research as it's, you know, research and development is how they make their new products. They don't want to share that. Interested, the one company that seemed to make a big claim without backing it up was GPA. They claim that their requirements are so demanding that the results of the helmet tests are on average 20% higher than the results of the recommended standards. So they say their helmets are 20% safer than what the standards are, but that's really all they say. Like they don't give any information as to why that would be true. And again, I feel like you could give information without like giving away your secrets. I also thought it was really interesting. They just, they just got a new website. Cause last time I was trying to look at their website, it wasn't active and now it is active. They are, I believe, a French company, so I'm going to blame this on Google Translate. <laughs> but somebody asked, like, one of their frequently asked questions is, why are GPA products expensive? Which is, like, I think fair. And this is their answer. For the following reasons. Add to regulation and security aspects, GPA takes also in considerations aesthetic and comfort. Therefore, GPA assumes that a helmet which is protecting the head needs a conception and an important research work in order to achieve the purpose of higher security. 
and not the other way around. First, think about a market price, then try to fit at best the method of making a security product in order to protect the head. GPA only works with the best material suppliers. So that like actually says pretty much nothing. Like, <laughs> I just love that it's like, head needs a conception and an important research work. Basically, I did read this to Ben because I was like, Ben, what does this mean? And his point was that a lot of these helmets are so expensive because they are creating a helmet first and then creating a price tag instead of saying, like, we want to sell a $100 helmet. How can we cut corners to make a $100 helmet? They're saying, these are the standards we want to meet. This is the quality we want. And then we'll figure out our price later. Okay. So that's their reasoning for why some of these products are so expensive. I also have another theory as to why these helmets are so expensive. It's because they can be sold on multiple markets. Helmets that are really affordable are only being sold on one market. So they only have one set of standards to meet. For example, think about Troxel or Ovation helmets. I don't know about all of them, but I know for Troxel for sure. They are only ASTM SEI certified. ASTM SEI certified is the lowest standard you can meet. And therefore, I think that's why their helmets are able to be so affordable is because they aren't trying to design helmets to meet stricter standards. They, they chose the lowest target to me. Oh, I never even thought of that. It's not the only explanation, but it's the explanation that I think, yeah, makes the most sense is that if you only, ASTM is the lowest bar to meet, why, you know, and that's a big market. Like, you don't, there's no need for them to try to meet British standards. They also fill that void, though, that others weren't meeting. Others weren't producing affordable helmets or cheaper helmets that a vast, like, majority could afford. You know, because not everyone can afford the expensive Charles Own or the GPAs or any of the other helmet brands, the 1Ks that like come up on the market. 1K is interesting. I did look them up. Um, I keep thinking they're Special K, but they're 1K. Um, (laughs) No, Special K is a cereal. I know that, but I want to call them Special K. Um, So 1K is, they are a US brand, but they do make their helmets for um, European standards. So their helmets, again, why they're more expensive. I think every helmet that is more expensive is going to be sold on a broader market. But each country also has their own Troxels. Like there are other helmets that are being sold that are only you can only buy in certain countries. And that's why it's really important that when you're purchasing a helmet, you make sure that you're purchasing a helmet from your own country or from a country in go to another country that has higher standards. But if you're riding in England, you can't use an American helmet or like a Troxel helmet does not pass English or the British helmet standards. So the other company that I find really interesting um, is Charles Owen. I am going to throw it out there. I'm a huge Charles Owens fan. Charles Owens fan. That sounds weird. They have very, very comfortable helmets and I really, I like skull caps. I think I look really great in a skull cap. So I, Charles Owen is like a family owned. They've been passed down generation after generation. So it's a really great company. Their website is actually really easy to navigate. They do talk a lot about the technology that they're using. And while they don't have any published research, I did notice a trend when I was looking at helmet research. Charles Owen is donating their helmets to all of these third parties to do research. So while it's not their research, they're not funding it, they're not like involved in any way other than, hey, you're gonna run some tests on helmets? I got free helmets, which I think is really interesting and kind of cool that they are willing to lend their helmets. They are, because I mean, these researchers, when you get a grant to do this research, you don't have a ton of money to buy like two, $300 helmets. Like that's not really what you want to do. Uh, you'd probably be buying the lower end helmets and would that be reflective of the mark like is that I don't know if that's the best choice for the study but maybe it is the best choice for the study but I do think it's really interesting that's Charles Owen who is continuously providing their helmets so I've got like three different studies that they have provided their helmets for oh wow that's actually really cool you know that helps get their helmets getting seen across different tests and finding out if there's flaws with their helmets or if their helmets have a certain strength over other kinds and stuff. It's actually really cool. Yeah, and a lot of these tests are looking at um, like the helmet standards. So they're trying to determine is the standards we have in place, are these reflective of the real world. So one of the studies was the influence of impact surface on head kinematics and brain tissue response during impacts with equestrian helmets. Another one was equestrian helmet standards. Do they represent real world accident conditions? And those are, that's a 2019 and 2020 study. So these are recent. And all of this research I thought was really interesting is being funded, a lot of it, not all of it, by Marie Skoldowska Curry grants. So there's a very specific grant that the European Union funds uh, through their research and innovation program. So the European Union is really pushing to be like the leader in a lot of this research. And so they're giving out lots of grants to researchers. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of these projects are not being funded 
or involving U.S. helmets. These aren't manu U.S. manufacturers being involved. A lot of this research into helmet safety is being funded by Europe and their developing standards. We know there's higher standards are being tested, so we know that there's you know there are helmets on the market that we can purchase easily that we know are meeting better standards, are more you know reflective of real world conditions because that's like the big push right now is these anvil tests are not reflective of real world conditions. What we're finding is that oblique impacts are actually one of the biggest causes of injury to riders' heads. That you aren't just dropped, like when you fall off a horse, you don't just smash head first into the ground and like lay there. That's just not how people fall <laughs> off their horses. But that's how that, but that's the test. The test is to just drop a helmet on the ground with a head in it. Think like that's what it looks like when you fall off your horse. And that's not. What happens most often is you get these side str strikes. A lot of times your head is rolling along the ground or it's striking at an angle and at the side. It's not just a straight drop and done. It's this more rotational impact and what they're finding is this rotational impact actually causes a lot more damage to the brain than just a straight drop and if all we're testing for is straight drops then how are we actually making a safer product and so one of the studies that i found was that 2020 equestrian helmet standards do they represent real world accident conditions and these researchers decided to look at you know these anvil tests. Do these anvil tests actually work? Are they actually reflective of what's going on? And currently equestrian helmets are designed to pass, you know, just that linear drop onto a rigid surface. So they wanted to know if they could use a more compliant surface. So they wanted to drop helmets on turf and sand, which is what most of us are riding on, and to see how that changed things. And what they found was that the results demonstrated that standards both had a higher magnitude of acceleration and shorter durations of impact than real world um, impacts. So what they did is they took a bunch of uh, real world accidents and they sort of put, put that into a computer program to figure out how it compared to these anvil tests. And what they found was that the anvil tests had bodies moving a lot faster, but they lasted a much shorter period of time. And that when you're falling in real life, you're it's going to last longer than a quick drop. They found that turf anvils actually did mimic what it was like to hit a real surface. So they believe that turf anvils adding that to this testing standards is important. So what they're finding is that we could do a lot better job testing our, our helmets and creating a lot better standards that actually are reflected of the real world because these are still causing concussions and that the helmets that are currently on the market aren't enough to actually protect in a real world situation. So the second study I found, um, and that, that study I just mentioned, the one I was talking about, all Charles Owen helmets. So I do love that like Charles Owen is donating their helmets, and then the answer is like, not good enough, and they still donate their helmets again. And I love that they're not like hiding it, that they're not like, oh, we don't want it to be our helmets that you're finding aren't sufficient. So the second study, which also Charles Owen donated helmets for, is called Evidence Basis for Future Equestrian Helmet Lateral Crash Certification Tests. So again, this is another test that wanted to find better ways testing helmets. Like they, again, what we're seeing now, this, these anvil tests don't work. So the general goal of this study was to determine how much of the impact forces a helmet could handle in the case of a rotational fall or a fall where the horse lands on the rider's head. Um, and so they wanted to find a method that was reflective of those situations. So a lot of times in rotational falls, you'll notice that the horse's bottom and the rider's head are really close together when they fall and that's often because the rider gets like thrown back or is sitting back as the horse begins to rotate. I just want to start with code word of the day. It's a new segment. Code word of the day. Your code word is biofidelic. <laughs> biofidelic. So this means modeling a biological system using a machine to crush the helmet is not very real world. So what they're trying to say is with this term, because they're going to use it in the study, is that they want to find something that models a biological system. And a machine is not modeling a biological system. So this was their attempt to find a non-anvil, non-machine test method to determine how much impact could be placed on a rider's head and helmet during a fall, um, specifically being hit by the head end, by the hind end. For this study, they what do you what do you think they decided to uh, drop the helmets onto? Do you think they decided to drop a bag of sand, smash a helmet into grass, drop a sack of potatoes on? onto these helmets? Uh, I have no idea. Probably something that closely resembles like a, 
a horse's weight or something. Very, very closely resembles a horse's weight. In fact, they picked up two dead horses and decided to drop the dead horses <laughs> onto helmets. Oh, no. So they had two dead horses that were recently euthanized uh, that morning. Nothing to do with the study. <laughs> um, and they tied them to a tractor, held them three feet in the air, and then repeatedly dropped them onto helmets. Just, you know, just to see. How, how how that went. Uh. So for this test, they had like four different places on the horse's bottom that they were dropping. So they dropped like the left hindquarters, right hindquarters, lumbar, and pelvis, as these were the most common areas that hit the head during a rotational fall. And then they dropped like each horse repeatedly per impact location. And I'm just thinking like, is this getting messy? Like, <laughs> there's no way this is like clean. You know what I'm saying? Like, guys, after a certain number of like dropping a dead horse like 12 times, it's not, it's not clean, is it? They're, this isn't clean. How do you think they presented that to the owners when they were like, do you want to donate your horse to science? We're going to drop him on helmets. <laughs> like, how do you ask an owner that? Do you think they told the owner or do they just like ask, can we, do you want to donate your horse to science? I, I don't know what they told the owner. Like, I don't even know how that conversation goes. And then it makes me really terrified that like, is this what it means when you donate your body to science? It's Is my body now just going to be dropped? Like, are you just going to smash me around with horse butts? Like, is that, is that the plan? <laughs> oh, my God. Is that the plan? How terrifying. Yeah, it's just, it's a little uncomfortable to think about. And a little bit like, oh, my God. It's just like, oh, you guys, there's no way this could have been clean. Like, that's all I keep coming back to is, like, it couldn't have been clean, right? Like, that Ugh. testing lab, you just smashed a dead horse into the ground 12 times, right? Like, it's not clean, is it? <laughs> oh my it's God. not clean. This is anymore. so horrifying to imagine. It's so horrifying. And they have pictures. I mean, because when I first read it, I was like, so they have like styrofoam horses? Like, I'm not sure I'm following. And then I saw the pictures and I was like, oh, no, those are not styrofoam horses. Those are horses, horses. Anyways, so basically they were really excited with this research because it was like the first time that, you know, um, work was biofidelic and represented, you know, the testing standards like they want this to be something that is repeated <laughs> and is a requirement so just an anvil drop you got to drop the helmet on an anvil and a dead horse on the helmet to figure it out to you know make sure that helmet's safe in their defense though they did point out that the poundage that these horses are landing on the helmets from three feet above is a lot and that it can still cause concussion so that the amount of weight these horses is dropping still is is a lot um and that the helmets did help to reduce pressure this weight on the like heads i mean when you think about a horse flying through the air and it weighs a lot and it's like velocity it's still a lot of pressure but it's not a crushing pressure that they're trying to, I think what they're trying to do is replace this with the crushing pressure because most horses don't just like stand on your head until your helmet pops. Never met a horse that did that, but maybe maybe there's horses out there. I feel like that's a, a conclusion though I could have come to without dropping a horse on a helmet, you know? I feel like I knew horses were heavy. Dropping heavy things on on a helmet is gonna cause damage, right? No, I mean I feel like there's a lot of heavy things you could have dropped on a helmet and figured this out i don't feel like a horse was necessary to drop on a helmet i feel like it was though i feel like we had to i think we had to know <laughs> oh no. I mean, this was 2020 so who knows what the computer programs were like then like they may not have had computer programs that could engineer a horse hitting a rider's head so their conclusions were that future research is obviously needed and that they need to continue to improve the standards for testing they want to in the future find horses of greater mass to drop they want to find different locations uh, of the horse to drop onto the, the helmet. They want to drop the horse from different heights, so three feet wasn't high enough. They want to drop a horse with a saddle on a helmet and see if that has any impact. Um, and then, back to our code word of the day, they would like a more biofidelic head form to drop the horse onto. Oh, so you really will be donating your body to science and have a horse dropping on your head. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you guys are looking for something to do... <laughs> Once you pass, not sure what you want to do with your body. Maybe you don't, maybe being buried doesn't sound cool. You could be strapped into a helmet and have a big horse dropped from a lot of feet up on Oh my God. I, I don't know what else to say, but like, how do you ask people? Are you like, so I see you've got a big horse. I'd really like to drop him from like 12 feet. Are you cool with that? Like, and can I put a saddle on him? Can he come with a saddle? Like, I don't know. I just, uh, it's, it's an interesting conversation. And 
I'm just imagining, honestly, like, this is just a bunch of, like, guys around the bar, like, one night being like, I've got the best idea for, a, like, an experiment. Like, I don't know. You've got to be somewhat drunk to come up with these ideas, right? Like, you can't sober oh, be there's like, no way. bigger horse, higher heights, and human head. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> like, you have to be somewhat, somewhat drunk to come up with these ideas, I feel like. So, I actually I have a question. Um. Who are the authors of your study? Because we'll dive into one of mine next, and I'm very curious as to who your authors were. So this is um, done by the University College of Dublin. Um, it's actually got a bunch of people, but I think it was done in Ireland. It's Thomas A. Connor, J. Michio Clark, Pieter Brahma, Matt Stewart, Eslingni Anada, and Michael D. Gilderchrist. Huh. I don't know who any of those people are. Well, okay. So th- that actually rules out that idea I had. So um, to dive into some of the research on air vests, there's another group of four different guys that actually came to the same conclusion your guys did that, hey, let's drop horse cadavers on things. Um, they also, they provided pictures. They they provided pictures. Oh, yeah? They provided pictures of like before and after was it was it messy there was tarps and there was tarps involved there was a lot of tarps involved there'd have to be the worst part of this was that um i don't know if this was the worst part but they actually only had one horse so they that poor guy was just getting dropped over and over again i imagine it's hard to get dead horses to drop on stuff like i imagine that's not like a box a lot of people check when their horses are like you know, being euthanized. The the drop box. I imagine just not a lot of people check it. <laughs> Probably not. So I guess to start off with the air vest, what I was looking into was the CO2 cartridge cross-country air vest that a lot of people are familiar with. You have like the Hit Air, Point Two, Arrowwear, Charles Owen even has their own. The idea behind them is that they protect your body, your spine, thorax, different areas of like your back and chest area from compression of a horse landing on you and bad falls and that the idea is that when you fall off the horse there's a little cord that rips pulls and disperses not disperses but like sets off a co2 canister that inflates the vest there i noticed when i was looking into the research there was really like two types of studies one was looking at the amount of compression or like shock absorption of the vest And then one was looking retrospectively at data of horse and rider falls from like FEI events or a pony club. Oh, interesting. Okay. One of the issues I was having when I was reading through the studies that look specifically at, you know, the amount of compression these air vests can take was they really weren't taking into account, you know, like a rider. They weren't really taking into account a moving horse's body or like how, how like an actual, that amount of compression of the vest, what does the rider look like afterwards? Like, yes, the vest can take that kind of impaction, but what does the rider look like after that kind of fall? But I didn't think I needed to drop cadavers onto um, a dummy with an air vest on it. I, I felt like we could solve this a different way. Yeah, but I don't, I think people really like that term biofidelic and got really, really into it um, and just want really biofidelic testing situations. Yeah, so this one was called um, Evaluation of the Effectiveness of an Exemplar Equestrian Air Jacket Against Crush Injuries. And it was published in 2016, so a little bit before your guys were dropping dead horses on things. Yeah, wow, my guys are late to the game. I didn't know we were dropping bodies so early. Yeah. Their goal and what they commented was that crash injury from a falling horse is not well understood. How can we understand this? Well, let's drop a horse on it. And their goal was to test how the impact of a rotational fall essentially provide a baseline of the forces exerted by a falling horse that they can apply to later studies. They dropped this one horse four different times from about four feet each time, once on the dummy wearing an inflatable vest and body protector, once on the dummy wearing only the body protector, which is just our traditional cross-country vest we all wear. And then they did two other tests where they dropped the horse on a force plate on its left side and another time where they dropped the horse on a force plate on its backside. And the reason they didn't continue dropping the horse was that they were afraid um, the bone fractures to the horse were going to start impacting their studies. Oh, my God. I mean, they said it in, like, a little bit nicer of terms, but that's what I took away from it. Oh Post-mortem, God. rigor mortis is oh going to start God. affecting how the dead horse falls on, on our vests. And I was like, oh, God, if that's an issue in your study, maybe we shouldn't do it. 
You know, maybe we should raise some red flags. Honestly, you know, all I'm picturing right now is somebody getting, making a really elaborate setup where they have like a dead horse with a dead rider, helmet, jump vest, and then they just launch it <laughs> over like a cross country fence so it gets a rotational fall and just smashes. Like that, I just see them and they're like, next, boom, next, boom, oh next, boom. Like that's what I imagine is about to happen. That's terrifying. I think that's the way the science is headed, though. Actually, no. I will give these guys credit okay. because at the end of their test, they said, perhaps a mechanical surrogate could be used instead of a horse cadaver. The reasoning was because they felt a mechanical surrogate would provide uh, more consistent results than, sure. you know, dropping the horses over and over again. Their body alters when they start breaking bones. So that was their logic behind it but what they did i mean the test i did they dropped the horse 12 times in the test i did and their conclusion was more <laughs> like, no i still can't get past that their conclusion was more we need to do more of this this is great <laughs> this is this is it and not only more but like every helmet and needs to be tested on this standards everybody's gotta do this yeah my guys did not come to that conclusion i think they were they dropped the horse four times. They're like, yeah, that's probably. Let's try getting a mechanical horse in here next time, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Your group was not uh, drunk. Your group was sober and realized this was a bad idea. What they found was that wearing the air vest did change the level of chest compression and suggest that wearing an air vest would be beneficial. So when the horse was dropped on the dummy wearing the air vest in conjunction with a typical cross-country vest, the chest compressed 66 millimeters, which corresponds with a 81% risk of receiving a severe chest injury. So still pretty high chance of receiving a severe chest injury, but when they dropped the horse's body onto the dummy wearing only the body protector, the chest compressed 77 millimeters, which has a risk of a 94% chance of receiving a serious chest injury. So it reduced that serious chance of injury by a little bit, but it's still pretty high even when you're wearing that air vest based on this study. So I think like that false sense of security you're kind of mentioning some of the Facebook groups we're talking about mm -hmm. is totally warranted because 81% of getting a serious chest injury with two body protectors on is still pretty high. Yes, and also when you watch a rotational fall, there is an impact, but like, I just don't know how reflective of dropping dead weight on a still dummy, like how reflective is that actually of what's happening in the real world? Like, right. that's what I'm saying. We gotta just start launching them over cross country fences. I think that's the only way to get good results. Strap them into a saddle, helmet, not quite. But I, you know, I think that's where some people are going with this. They did mention at the end of their study that they would like to um, thank British Eventing for funding them. And I was like, oh God, they got funding to drop a dead horse on something. Mine got grants. These were grants as well. So yeah. Essentially, you know, what it came down to, theirs was honestly the most in-depth of the studies that looked at the compression of which these vests can take and what happens to the dummies when they're wearing these type of vests and like what the difference is between just a standard body protector versus an air vest with a body protector. And the issue that I was having with a lot of these tests was I was like, that's great and all, but most of us aren't dummies just laying there waiting for like a weight to crush us. Most of us are still alive and like <laughs> right? moving. We're still trying to get out of the way of that falling horse, right? So how does this actually impact riders? The second like kind of category of studies is that they were looking at data collected by either FEI or USPC evaluating, you know, how many riders fell? What were the riders wearing? Was it just a body protector? Was it an air vest with a body protector? What was the severity of their injuries? And so the first study I wanna talk about here was actually done, it was done in 2018, and their goal was to investigate the risk reduction benefit of wearing just a standard body protection safety vest in equestrian sports. And they were specifically looking at USPC, so United States Pony Club data results where they were noting the rider's age, gender, certification levels. They were trying to figure out, you know, are younger riders or like lower level riders more at risk of injury? Uh, are higher level riders more at risk for injury? The type of activity they're doing, the description of incidents, description of injuries, and protective equipment worn. What they found in the study was that there was a decrease in injuries when body protection was worn on cross country, but not in other types of riding. Kind of makes sense because you typically have different types of falls outside of cross country. I would yeah. say cross country is pretty unique. That and like steeplechase with the, what type of falls you're going to see. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a higher risk, higher risk of injury. Yeah. But they noted, you know, wearing a body protector and show jumping actually didn't have, it didn't really change the result of injury that people were seeing. 
which I thought was interesting because like interesting. show jumping is still jumping, but it's very different than our cross country style of jumping. Yeah, and your falls are probably very different too. Oh yeah. And they also noted in this study that the severity of injury did not correlate with a lesser experienced equestrian. So where they thought like a lower experienced rider would have a higher rate of injury, it actually wasn't, there was no relationship between that. Okay, so the follow-up though is I would like to know what the combined level of experience between horse and rider are. I'd be curious if there's a correlation there. Like if you have a green horse, if you have green horse, green rider, right? Green on green makes black and blue. Is that true? You know what I'm saying? Like if it's a more experienced rider with a green horse, like is there a risk there? Yeah, I feel like that's just another step taking the studies and they of course didn't go into that. They, you know, look at the first step and then they stop right there and they're like, okay, this is what we're looking at. Yeah, no, sure. But that'd be a really interesting question to ask and try to find the answers to next. And then the last study that I'll mention and talk about is where they actually looked at do riders who wear an air jacket in equestrian eventing have reduced injury risk in falls? And they had a retrospective data analysis. But I thought it was really interesting that when they were looking at air jackets, they specifically were looking at eventing. I mean, you're going to have the most there, so that makes sense. What they were looking at, the study that was published in 2019, was they were looking at FEI competitions on an international scale. So they weren't looking specifically at one country or another. They were looking at the totality of FEI um, Competitions held across between 2015 and 2017. And the reason they were looking at 2015 as their starting point was because FEI data actually didn't start including in their fall analysis or like injury analysis if their riders were wearing an air jacket or just a traditional body jacket or not until 2015. Okay. So that was the earliest starting point that they had. They collected data on 1,819 riders who fell wearing an air vest compared to 1,486 riders who fell without wearing an air jacket and were just wearing a standard body protector. The way they were having to go through the injuries and analyze them was by FEI standards of recording injuries. And FEI only records injuries in two categories. One is no injury slash slight injury. And the other category is serious slash fatal injury. So they don't really break it down any further. It's just those two kind of broad categories which is those are two pretty different categories like i feel like there's a lot in between like a broken leg is that fatal or is that no injury yeah does that count as serious i I don't know like it's very confusing how fei defines stuff and i can't figure out do you think fei does that oh i'm sure they come off looking better no i'm sure that yeah i mean not so that you look better but yeah you can put a lot less like a broken leg probably isn't considered serious where in a hospital stay is probably considered serious or like being unconscious for several days in a hospital. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, yeah, I don't I don't know what the benefit would be just to be like, we're not dangerous. Maybe lower insurance rates. I don't know. <laughs> oh, maybe it's an insurance thing. Yeah, that could be possible. Probably. Yeah. What they found was that out of all those riders I mentioned, 3,203 of those riders sustained no injury to slight injury. 102 of those riders over the course of two years, received serious or fatal injuries. And they don't actually record how many of those injuries were fatal. They just kind of lump them all together with serious injury. So I was a little bit annoyed with that. Yeah. But once again, they probably can't break it down because FBI isn't recording that information for them. They found 55% of riders who fell, period, out of any of those numbers were wearing air vests and that out of the serious injuries sustained, 67.6% of them were wearing air vests. But they kind of elaborate further on this point by saying that like further research is needed to understand the reasons behind this because it obviously can't be strictly because of the air vest. Is it, they have questions that they mention in their discussion of are riders that are more prone to these serious injuries the ones that are wearing the air vest and now we're just seeing them falling? Like it's not a fair thing to just say that, look, they're overrepresented. They acknowledge that is that just because more people are wearing the air vest than just body protectors and now you're going to see a larger number of those falling off having these air vests on? I mean, I think that goes back to that full sense of security question that, you know, you probably put on the air vest and think that you have more protection so you can ride that riskier horse or you can take maybe chances you wouldn't have if you didn't have a vest on. So I wonder if like that's part of it is that you're seeing riders who know that they have, that are starting the ride knowing they have a greater risk. They're riding a hotter horse or things aren't worked out as well or they just moved up a level. Like it'd be nice to you know, to start documenting all that information as well because I bet there is a trend there. I've actually always had this question about air vests. I personally am not one that likes to ride in big clunky clothes or anything because 
it just like I feel like it interferes with my movement and I don't like that in this study they actually talk about the fact that air vests restrict riders movement and hinder their tuck and roll ability which if we've all seen those videos that teach you how to properly fall off a horse they talk about being able to tuck and roll and with the way air vests work you you can't really do that once it's expanded on you the idea of it expanding though like part of that is to protect the neck I thought because like that's something that I think people forget a lot is that like a helmet just protects the head and the brain but you can still get paralyzed and severely injured by like breaking your neck and that the air vest is trying to protect the neck in that regard. There was another point of potential why air vests are higher up there for serious injuries is they refer back to a study that was done in Switzerland where they tested five different equestrian air jacket products popular on the Swiss market Mm -hmm. and they measured um the amount of force needed to pull and trigger the deployment of these vests. And they range between 150 to 593 newtons. Potentially, the forces required to pop that little CO2 cartridge could alter the rider's fall trajectory and actually be bringing them closer to the horse and raise their risk of being crushed or trample injury. Oh, interesting. Because they're they're tethered in and so they're being kept closer to the horse until it pops. And obviously different brands of these vests are going to have different strength required to pop them, right? Because we've all seen people that get off their horse and forgot to unclip and they pop their vest. And they've also seen the kid that was lucky that they hopped off, but theirs didn't pop. And so they're just sitting there dangling, waiting for someone to come unhook them. Yeah, interesting. The different force required to pull and trigger that CO2 cartridge could be hindering a rider in their fall that instead of like the rider where they would typically be able to bounce away from the horse a little bit impacts that. So that was kind of like where I fell and left off with my research was those that look at air vests in a strictly laboratory setting find that they do offer more protection than a standard body protector. But those that look at it and analyze data of riders falling off as well as look at the air vest actually in real life scenarios find that there's either no difference or potentially a higher risk and higher increase of injury with the air vest on. Yeah, and I I think that's the same that we're running into with helmets is that these standards that we're trying to meet and design a product to aren't don't really mean anything once you get out into the real world that these aren't this isn't what's happening. You are still at risk. You're maybe at a little less risk, but you're still at risk. Right. I think that was like my biggest takeaway from the air vest and my research there was that that false sense of security you mentioned, a hundred percent real. I think a lot of people might get a false sense of security and potentially like recklessness from wearing an air vest when the reality is it doesn't save you that much. Like it, you're still going to be at a high risk if you start moving up the levels too quickly. Like it's so much more going into it than just the vest protection. Yeah, that's really you. interesting. I mean, that's kind of like the same conclusion, right? We came to with bits is that like it's not just the rider's hands. It's just not. It's not just one factor. It is all these factors combined that are going to put you at risk, and that that piece of equipment can only do so much yeah that's pretty much all i had for my research i don't know if you had anything you wanted to add for helmets so i had one final like research one final theory and research study that i wanted to talk about because this research is study is all over the internet and people are constantly misunderstanding it they love to quote it they're still quoting it in recent articles but it is very misunderstood so this is a 2018 study that was conducted by a swedish insurance group named folksum Uh, What they did is they took 15 helmets that were on the Swedish market. Uh, They didn't have like some of the the brands we would recognize in America. They didn't have. They had other brands that we've never heard of. But they did have brands like Back on Track and Charles Owen and GPA that they tested. And basically the goal that people thought they were doing is that they wanted to rank these 15 helmets. They wanted to put them through some tests and see if these 15 helmets, like which one was the best one, which one is the worst one. There is, as far as I can tell, no information as to the helmet ranking. I did find on the Snell website that they specifically said, while they internally rank the helmets, right, they do all the testing, they know what helmet's the safest, they will not share that information with the public. (laughs) I have a theory that it's because it would be bad business. If you say Troxel is the least safe helmet, you are going to affect their business and their sales. And so I'm sure that there's probably some agreement that there will be no ranking of helmets so that you are not affecting anyone's business. Seems shady. I would like to know which is the most effective. Well, I guess it depends on who's... Yeah, that's weird. I mean, if you thought about it, if an independent or if the ASTM came out and was like, this is the list of safest to least safest helmet, they all pass tests, but one of these is way better than the others, that would be... You know, I get they're not a government agency, so they get away with they don't have to do it that way. But like, 
I bet there's probably some agreement that you don't get to release that information. You just gonna say we passed the, the test if we're gonna pay you and use your standards. So this study that tested 15 helmets, um, these were helmets that were already tested and approved by Swedish standards. And again, many of these helmets are helmets you would have recognized. Um, some of them you wouldn't, some you would. They put them through the four physical tests. They were looking if they could absorb shock. That's just like this straight drop. And then they put the, each helmet through three oblique impact tests. And those oblique impact tests are the ones we were talking about earlier that are more reflective of the real world. So what they did is they tested all these helmets. They gave them each a score and then they ranked them out. And so what they found is that the best helmet, the helmet that won the award and was 30% better than the average helmet was the Back on Track EQ3 Linux helmet. Back on Track EQ3 was rated second and Charles Owen Air 8 was rated third. So those are the three best helmets. However, their study was actually conducted to prove that this technology, a specific technology, was needed. And so these tests were specifically show, designed to show something called MIPS technology is needed in our helmets. And I don't disagree that MIPS technology is needed, but they conducted the study in such a way that only helmets that used MIPS technology would be ranked up higher. And the helmets that didn't use MIPS technology mm. would be ranked at the bottom. So it was a very like on purpose trying to design this test. So what they concluded at the end of the study was that they need there needs to be a standard that requires these helmets to look at that rotational fall aspect that you have to, we have to start requiring this as a test and that the only way a helmet is gonna pass right now is by using MIPS technology. So this was a Swedish company, uh, MIPS technology, which I'll explain real briefly what it is, but who do you think invented it? An American, a Frenchman, or a Swede? Swede. Yes, so a Swedish company tested a Swedish technology, and where do you think Back on Track's headquarters is located? Sweden. Exactly. So <laughs> you can see this test may have been a little bit biased, and they're claiming that you have to use MIPS technology, and you have to test for it, and it has to be required in all helmets. It seems like the Swedes might be benefiting from this study, and the study is everywhere. Everyone is like quoting this folksome study being like, this is the safest helmet, and I'm not saying Back on Track's helmets aren't the safest, but there's a lot of bias going into this study. I didn't even know Back on Track made helmets. They do, and I'm so sorry, Back on Track. They are so ugly. <laughs> I I was like, okay, if this is the safest helmet, I'll, let me... Nope, that's a hard pass. That's a hard <laughs> pass. So what is MIPS technology? So it is a multi-directional impact protection system. Basically, it is a liner in your helmet that allows your helmet to swivel about 10 to 15 millimeters when it impacts like the ground or something. So it gives the helmet, the helmet fits securely, but it has this inner layer that is able to just kind of swivel ever so slightly in order to reduce friction. Because what we have seen is a lot of studies are still are finding that the helmets we have on the market today are not enough and the helmets themselves are actually contributing to concussions because they are so rigid. So when your head hits it, your head is very static oh. in that helmet and it doesn't move like your brain when you're brain hits the inside of your skull, it actually moves, like there's movement. Your brain's not like locked in place. There's a little bit of play. And so what they're trying to do is design a helmet that's more reflective of your brain and your skull. So then it would be like a brain and a skull and a helm head and a helmet. Like you see what I'm saying? It's like a- Yeah, I smell your step in. Yeah, it's like a turducken of the brain world or head helmet world. So this MIPS technology is now in Charles, some of the Charles Owen helmets. And it actually is, I think, a great addition to the market. And it's definitely a direction you're gonna start seeing MIPS technology available in more and more helmets. So I do think it's great. Um, I just think the study, you guys need to actually read the study and understand what it is before thinking back on track has the safest helmet. Maybe they do. The study was designed specifically so back on track would win. Like, I'm just gonna, just gonna be honest. So my conclusion basically at the end of the day when it comes to helmets is that I would definitely look to buy helmets that are not just meeting American standards. If that's all I can afford, that's all I can afford. I do own a Troxel, it's cute. I wanted a barrel <laughs> racing looking helmet, so I bought a Troxel. But um, I would definitely look at helmets that do meet multiple standards as they're theoretically a little bit safer, but keeping in mind that a helmet is only as good as the fall like, <laughs> as long as you're falling and it matches the anvil test you're good but if you fall in a different way that doesn't match the anvil test sorry 
Interesting. I had no idea. Who would have guessed that we would have the lowest? Actually, I could have guessed that we would have the lowest. You know, I could have guessed that too. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I have. That's my thoughts, folks. Yeah, I don't really have any final conclusions other than double check your products. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you guys were equally as horrified as we were to find. I'm telling you that is that you got to start launching the bodies over cross-country fences. It's the only way. Get a catapult no. and just start. No. It's the only way. It's the only way we're going to know for no. sure. No. I think so. I stand by absolutely freaking not. I'll, I'll drop a design because I think I think it's going to be quite, quite, quite good. Quite good. If you're so into it, I hope you're donating your body to science after this. And I'd like you to put in like a little clause note that must go to being launched out of a cannon. <laughs> must be launched. Must be launched. <laughs> If you have any questions, any other horrifying studies you'd like to share with us, um, you can reach out to us on Instagram at inthebarn.pod or you can send us an email at inthebarnpod at gmail.com. Otherwise, don't forget to leave a review uh, and enjoy enjoy your, your horses. Bye.